Hi, I'm Dan Thompson, and this is part two of uh, my story of Brighton. So as I was saying, uh, my grandfather, Clive Thompson, Thomas Clive Thompson, uh, moved to Brighton in uh, 1931. At that time, he uh, took over or purchased the law practice of the late George Drury. And uh, my dad was seven, and he had two brothers, Terry and Mike. They were like four and two and then the next year my grandmother had twin boys so there was five brothers that, that grew up in Brighton and uh, my dad uh, joined the army like a lot of guys in World War II and uh, served overseas uh, when he returned he uh, basically finished high school and then uh, was enrolled in law school he attended Osgood Hall Law School and when he graduated, uh, he worked briefly in Toronto and then uh, decided they, my mom, who was a nurse by this point, they decided to uh, move back to home. So they moved to Brighton. And shortly after they moved to Brighton, my sister Sharon was born. And the next year, uh, I, I was born. And my dad uh, continued uh, in the law practice until uh, 1957 when he decided to run for parliament. So in June, uh, June 10th, 1957, he was elected as the Progr Progressive Conservative Member of Parliament for Northumberland Riding. And uh, he was uh, elected again in March of 1958, which was uh, the Diefenbaker majority, historic majority. And he served until 1962, uh, by which point uh, my mother had had our youngest sister, Eleanor. She was born in October 50 or 61. So I think my mother's decision was that he was not going to continue in politics because uh, she needed her around to help with all these kids. And then by this point, we were living at, at 36 Young Street. And uh, as I said, I, I was in grade four when we moved there. My, my grandfather, Clive Thompson, grew up in Sault Ste. Marie. And he was one of six uh, children. Um, he was, I think, middle child. Uh, he served in the First World War with the Canadian Expeditionary Forces and actually got captured. He was a POW for a year or something like that. And after the war, he came back to uh, Toronto and went to law school. And he married my grandmother, uh, Isabel Cope, and uh, practiced. He was a government lawyer for about 10 years uh, before moving to Brighton. And uh, his father uh, was William John Thompson, uh, who was a second generation Canadian. His, his father, uh, Thomas H. Thompson, came from Northern Ireland to the Guelph area in the 1850s. And uh, my, my great grandfather ended up going up to the Sioux, where he was a very successful merchant, had a big store there, and actually served as the uh, mayor of Sault Ste. Marie several terms in the late 1800s, early 1900s, his, his picture's on the wall in City Hall for a couple of terms serving as mayor. Um, he was still around when I was little. There's a picture uh, you'll see of uh, my dad and my grandfather, Clive, and my great-grandfather, uh, W.J., they used to call him. And we're outside um, my grandparents' house on Main Street, which is the present location of the uh, Brighton Sports and Wellness Clinic on the north side of Main Street. That was that was their house, Grampy and Granny. And I I was too young to really remember him, um, so he died actually from complications arising out of a of a car accident. The story was his housekeeper got into an accident. She was driving him around somewhere in the Sioux, and and he um, was injured, but he managed to get out of the car and go into a local pub and have a few drinks, I guess, before the uh, ambulance came to collect him. But uh, ultimately, I think he was a, a man in his 90s by this point, and that's the story. He, he died from complications arising out of this accident. So uh, my, my dad and his brothers uh, grew up in Brighton, and apparently my, my grandmother always made them dress up to go to school, so they had like creased pants and shiny shoes and, and white shirts, and they were kind of known for having to be all duded up like that. And the story is that uh, 
in, this is in the depression so there wasn't a lot of cash around so people uh, like my grandfather professional uh, person business person was well respected but not well to do uh, particularly and at one point I'm told uh, he did a case for a client and was paid with a milk cow um, so they managed to find a spot to uh, keep this cow and my dad and the brothers would go over and milk it I guess and, and that was their family supply of milk for a while another time when the family lived uh, on Main Street and they had a, a garage in the back uh, I'm told that one day the boys were trying to back Grampy's car out of the their dad's car out of the driveway I think his Uncle Terry was driving he's holding the door open while he's looking back only didn't realize that he was going to run into the garage door and t tore the door off uh, grand grandfather's car. Well, he, he couldn't afford to fix it, so he, he drove around with no door for, for a while until he could afford to fix it. My, my grandfather was the organist and choir master at St. Paul's Church, and my dad and all the brothers were in the choir. There's a, a photograph, a nice picture of the five of them, six of them, I guess, the five brothers and their dad in their vestments choir gowns um, in the in the tower uh, room of uh, the steeple room of, of at St. Paul's so growing up in Brighton uh, I, I went to Brighton Public School and uh, the Brighton Public School just had got a kindergarten class the the year before I went my dad was on the school board at the time uh, and and he rounded up a, a kindergarten teacher for the the year prior to mine, my sister Sharon's year. Uh, I graduated from public school in 1965 and uh, went across the field to uh, ENSS. And that was in those days, of course, you know, you went uh, for five years to grade 13. So I graduated in 1970. But while I was uh, in uh, high school, uh, the music program was, was a big thing. And we had a very keen uh, music teacher at that time named Keith Baum, who's a Dutchman. And uh, he, he was very keen on getting uh, fancy uniforms, band uniforms for the, for the music program. So we got this idea to uh, raise money by putting on a musical production. So it was the start of a long tradition of musical productions at uh, ENSS. And in the first one, uh, it was I was in grade 11, so 67, 68, and um, I, uh, I was the drummer in the, in the stage band. Uh, when I was like in grade seven, my dad taught me to play the trombone. He was a big trombone player, and I always played in a band or orchestra or two or three. And um, by the time I got to grade nine, I was playing the trombone in the junior band and the senior band and the stage band and all the bands so it's kind of boring and decided I wanted to be a drummer and that kind of led into uh, getting into a, a rock band because my sister was going out with this guy uh, who was a bass player and I ended up getting uh, into this group with these guys and by the time I finished grade 13 we had a group that uh, uh, played regular uh, engagements. Uh, we had a truck, a van, an agent, pictures, uh, all the equipment. And in those days there was a lot of like high school dances, like high schools had regular dances and we played a lot of uh, area schools. And uh, that actually uh, <clears throat> included in the summertime we would play at the Presque Isle Pavilion, which was at that time uh, Presque Isle Pavilion was uh, part of the Presque Isle Summer Hotel property which is on the site of what is now the government dock, it's called at Presque Isle. It's all homes uh, that are on the property that used to be the hotel on the water side and the pavilion dance hall on the road side. And uh, it, it, it was well past its uh, glory days by then, but uh, the owner, whose name was Grant Quick, was an elderly gentleman who uh, had a wholesale fish business in Gosport, as well as running the hotel. Um, finally relented and, and started hiring uh, rock groups to, to play uh, during the summer and it would not be unusual for a thousand kids to young people 
you know, from the ages of 15 to 25 to show up uh, on a Saturday night and, uh, and dance to the music and there'd be hot rod cars squealing up and down the road and always the next day in the parking lot uh, there would be a treasure trove of empty bottles. Uh, of course, the drinking age in those days was 21. <laughs> but anyway, there was a lot of um, consumption, I guess, that went on. That all came to an end in uh, 71. Mr. Quick passed away just uh, on Labor Day weekend of 1971. And the end result was that the, the hotel property was sold and the buildings were demolished and the land uh, was subdivided into lots for for residences but we were very fortunate our our gang to um, get in on the on the last days of Presque Isle I'm not sure if the local cottagers and residents appreciated it much especially on the long weekends when they would have a, a dance that started at midnight and so the, the music would be blaring from midnight till 3 a.m. Um, stuff you'd never get away with today but uh, that was a lot of fun and, and we were really lucky to be to be part of that 